Greetings again, everybody. We're going to talk here about a very, very, very important topic that is extremely high yield for all of the steps, and that is angina. This is so common in the clinic, in the ER, because it's chest pain. And chest pain is something that you need to know how to work up. So it commonly gets tested on CCS because if you don't know how to work up chest pain, if you don't know how to identify a patient who may be having a heart attack, you do not belong in a white coat. Um, so medical licensing boards expect you to know how to deal with this. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or in the I button in the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put a new video up. Okay, so what is angina? Angina is chest pain due to exertion. However, it doesn't have to be a lot of exertion. So something as simple as getting up out of bed and going to the bathroom sink to brush your teeth, that could do it. Now, we have a few, a couple different types of angina, and then one's kind of different. Um, so we have stable angina, and that's angina that is it's chest pain that comes on with exertion, yep, like any angina, but then you sit down, you lay down on the couch, and it gets better after maybe a few minutes, okay? Now, unstable angina is similar to stable, but it does not get better with rest. It may continue, okay? Now, for that reason, with stable angina, we tend to see these patients in the clinic. We don't see these patients in the ER uh, because... If they sit down in the car as they're being taken to the ER, it gets better unless they don't turn around and go home. You know, so these patients will come into the clinic saying, yeah, you know, doc, I keep getting these pain, these this chest pain. And it goes away, but, you know, I'm concerned. Am I having a heart attack? What's going on? That's stable angina. Unstable angina, it does not get better. And so these patients tend to come into the ER. So look for that in the vignette. Another thing is that with stable angina, if they're telling you they're having pain with exertion, you want to know how much exertion, okay? If it's chest pain after they, you know, jog a mile, well, that's totally different from chest pain uh, from, like I said, getting up to go brush your teeth. Um, so you want to know because one of them is much higher acuity than the other. Okay, then there's Prinz metal angina. That is different. I will do a video on that because it's a little trickier. Uh, so usually angina is due to coronary artery disease, 99% uh, of cases. Uh, the pain is substernal. It's commonly described as crushing, heavy, tight. It really doesn't radiate too much. Um, there can be referred pain, but the pain in the chest is pretty much right in the middle of your chest. And that's because it's from the heart, okay? Um, so there can be some radiation, better way to call it is referred pain. So it goes to the lower jaw, upper arm, um, especially the left arm and shoulder. Um, that is uh, very commonly seen in heart attacks. Uh, these episodes of angina will usually last under three minutes with rest. If it continues more than that, um, it's suspicious for unstable angina or possibly something that has nothing to do with the heart, like reflux disease. I can't tell you how many patients come into the ER saying, I think I'm having a heart attack. We do an EKG, it's fine. We get enzymes, it's fine. We get a chest x-ray, it's fine. It's GERD, okay? <laughs> we give them the GI cocktail and they're better and we send them on their way. This is just a way you can think of angina. Angina includes stable and unstable. Unstable angina can be a non-MI or it can be an MI. MIs can be divided into STEMI and NSTEMI, which we will talk about in the next video. This is the pathophysiology of angina. I am not going into this. This is step one stuff, but suffice it to say, angina is where the oxygen demand outweighs the oxygen supply to the myocardium. Okay, so angina is due to coronary artery disease. Uh, there are a number of modifiable risk factors, so things that you can fix. Cholesterol levels, particularly LDL. Our target LDL is going to be under 100 in most people. We'll get to that. Smoking, uh, high blood pressure, being overweight, sedentary lifestyle. So all these you can fix. Get up, get moving, get into an exercise program, 
Watch your diet. Hypertension, we can give medications for that. Stop smoking, okay? Non-modifiable risk factors include age. Can't really change that, unfortunately. Uh, I should say male sex here, so XY, right? And then genetic predisposition. Uh, so if you have a parent who had a heart attack at a younger age, um, that puts you at higher risk. All right, let's look at this vignette. We got a 62-year-old guy uh, with a history of high cholesterol coming into the clinic complaining of episodes of substernal pain that he describes as crushing. He says that these episodes are brought on by going up the stairs or chasing after his dog, but they're relieved promptly by rest. Okay, what is this? Stable angina. And in red here is what gives it away. Also, he's coming into the clinic. Okay, so it can't be that bad, right? So he's got high cholesterol. That's a risk factor. He's 62. That's a risk factor. He's got substernal pain. That's crushing. That's classic. And it's relieved by rest. So it's stable angina. All right, what are we going to do for a workup? We want to get a baseline EKG. Anytime you got somebody coming in with chest pain, EKG immediately. Lipid panel, remember, uh, coronary artery disease that's associated with high cholesterol, CBC, BMP, and a fasting blood glucose. Now, this guy is all, he's already got a history of high cholesterol. Um, so, um, it may be that the medication he's taking is not controlling it. We didn't see a, uh, a medication list for this guy. Uh, but uh, if he is, let's say, on a statin, we may need to up his dose or perhaps add something like azetamibe, which we commonly add on to statins. We'll get more to the management in a little bit. So what we usually see with stable angina is pretty much nothing. Okay, we don't really see anything. Um, now, on the lipid panel, it may be a new patient coming in, and they've got high cholesterol, and we need to address that. So our management, all of these patients with stable angina, any kind of angina, they're going to get aspirin. Okay, It reduces the risk of developing a heart attack. Remember, aspirin is a COX inhibitor that reduces thromboxane A2, which is a platelet. Um, it brings platelets in. Okay, It causes aggregation. Uh, we're going to put him on a beta blocker. Uh, we'll put him on statins. Um, and then uh, that is going to depend, though, on the LDL level. So if they're over 100, we put them on statins. Um, the target LDL really, um, in most patients, is actually going to be under 100. Um, and then in patients with more risk factors, it's going to be under 70. We'll give him nitroglycerin to take as needed, and then the typical lifestyle modifications. Do not ignore these, though. On CCS, you'll be expected to counsel the patient about this. You will lose points if you don't do that. This is when we give statins. Obviously, coronary artery disease is the big one, but peripheral artery disease, aortic disease, which I'm going to talk about in a, a few more videos down the road. So uh, these are pretty important. All right, now a stress test is something we're going to do in this guy. This is um, going to be done in anyone with a new uh, diagnosis of angina. And what we're doing is we're going to determine the extent of the disease, how bad it really is. Um, so usually we do an exercise stress test. This is um, for patients that are basically healthy enough to do it. Um, so some patients can't get on the treadmill. They can't use the bike. Maybe they're morbidly obese. Maybe they've got osteoarthritis of the knees. Um, and we have another way to, to uh, do a stress test for them. But for most people, we do the exercise stress test. We want to get their heart rate up, ideally to 220 minus their age. So this guy was 60-ish. So we want to get his heart rate up to 160 optimally to get a good reading. And then the uh, positive stress test is defined as ST depression of more than two millimeters or a, uh, a drop in blood pressure of more than 10 millimeters of mercury. All right, now the chemical stress test is used, like I said, in patients that just can't do the exercise stress test or if they have pre-existing anomalies which would make it difficult to read those changes in the EKG. So there are a couple ways we can do this. The dobutamine echo stress test. So we give dobutamine. We have uh, an echo going on. We're looking for the heart wall motion. If there's decreased movement, that's a positive stress test. Uh, the scintigraphy or diperitomal thallium stress test. Um, 
basically thallium acts like potassium, it gets taken up into the heart muscle. We scan it. If there's decreased uptake in any area, that's a positive test. Now, if they have a positive stress test, then our next step is an angiogram. We want to determine the extent of the disease. Um, and uh, depending on the findings, we may do cabbage or PCI, um, revascularization. Um, and that's going to depend on the extent of the involvement. And we'll go into this more when we talk about MI. And this is just a recap of everything we talked about. All right, now let's just look at this uh, this vignette here. We got a 62 year old guy with hypercholesterolemia now coming into the ED, complaining of current substernal pain um, that he describes as crushing. Yeah, it comes on as he's going up the stairs chasing after his dog, but this episode has continued despite rest. What is this? Unstable angina. It may be a myocardial infarction. So what do we do? EKG. Okay, now that's the best initial diagnostic test, but you should be giving this guy aspirin too. Um, as we're going to go into, if somebody comes in with, um, with crushing chest pain, suspicious for an MI, we give morphine, oxygen if they're satting below 90, nitrates, and aspirin. We want to get cardiac enzymes, um, and uh, we will go into this in the next talk where I talk about unstable angina and MI.